So we are now recording. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Aperio Teaching and Learning Conference Call. Today is Wednesday, March the 1st, and my name is Matthew Burgess. I work with the University of Virginia, and I'll be facilitating this call today along with Tricia Gordon, who's also joining us. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about accessible course design, and we're very lucky to have Dave Evelyn and Terry Golightly, who is braving some very difficult weather. Uh, from Johnson University who are going to be talking to us. Uh, please don't forget to sign in on the Etherpad and the link to the Etherpad is in the top of the chat window. So feel free to sign in on the Etherpad there. And before we get started with our presentation, we might take just a few minutes to see if we have any announcements. I know that Neil Caden, our fearless Sakai community coordinator who usually does a lot of our announcements, is not feeling very well today, so he may not be with us. But if we have any other announcements, let's go ahead and do those now. I see that Luisa is on the call. I don't know if she has any announcements about Atlas or any other projects that she works on. But if anybody else has any announcements, feel free to come on the mic or post them right here in the chat. Um, hi, Matt. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Pretty good. This is Luisa. Um, thank you for f finding my name in there. Uh, just a very quick, brief announcement. Um, like I said, the last time we met, Atlas is opening right now, and the due date is March 20th. Uh, and also, we're calling for peer reviewers. Um, well, what do we use? Um, the term we used last time was judges. Uh, peer reviewers for all the applications. Uh, so if you know anybody who is interested please contact me and we also uh, will provide training on the rubrics and how to evaluate those applications thank you thanks louisa for that announcement and for those of you who are not as familiar with atlas i have put the link to the atlas page on the sakai project website in the chat so feel free to click on that Check that out. Many of the Atlas Award presenters often present at Open Aperio, and those presentations are really, really great. We've also had some award winners present for us. Some of you may have seen those presentations. Those are generally outstanding. So please check that out, and if you're interested in getting involved, uh, let Louisa know, or she will hunt you down, because she is awesome about ruthlessly tracking people down and getting them to help out, which is really great. I'll go ahead and make one general announcement about Open Aperio, just because I've seen some proposal acceptance emails go out. So I know that you know some people are being notified about proposal submissions, and we're moving closer to Open Aperio, which is going to be the first week of June in Philadelphia. I'm going to go ahead and post the link to the Open Aperio website in the chat. So that's now available for you. Um, for those of you who have never been to Open Aperio, it's really a great event, one of the best events to meet with other people in the Sakai community, um, see them face to face, find out exactly what they're doing, collaborate with them on projects. Dave notes in the chat, if you've not gone before, you should really go if you can. I completely agree. In fact, Tricia and I had a meeting yesterday and we were just talking about how we were going to find Dave at Open Aperio this year and hunt him down to talk about lessons templates. So Dave, we will pay for you to go because we want to mine for your knowledge. <laughs> I can't really commit to that, but I wish that I could. <laughs> but anyway, it is a really great event. So for those of you who have not gone before, I would really recommend that you try to find a way to go, if at all possible, if it works with your schedule and your department budget. If you have gone before, we hope that we will see you there. Um, so do check out the website, see some of the abstracts for some of the proposals that have already been posted there. Uh, Malcolm Brown from Educause is going to be the main keynote speaker. He is outstanding. Many of you have probably seen him in various contexts. So please do check that out. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send those to Neil um, or to the other contacts on the Open Aperio website who can give you more information about that. 
Any other announcements before we hand things off to Dave and Terry? Matt, I'll just briefly mention, since uh, Neil is not here today, that for those who may not be familiar, I noticed Sakai 11.3 dropped on, November, on February 25th. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Is this Adam? Yes, it is. I thought I recognized your voice. Thanks, Adam. So just another note uh, for those of you who may not have seen this go out across the Sakai lists that Sakai 11.3 has been released. Um, so congratulations to everyone who worked on that. Uh, another really great advancement for the community. I saw that there were a large number of bug fixes and other things that were incorporated into that release. So that's really great, and a lot of schools are going to benefit from that. So thanks to everybody uh, who worked on that. And Dave notes in the chat that Neil is working on the release notes for that if they haven't been released already. So thanks for that, Dave. Okay, so barring any other announcements, let's go ahead and turn things over to Dave Evelyn and Terry Golightly from Johnson University who are going to talk to us a little bit about their online and hybrid course development and the things that they have done to make those courses a little more accessible uh, for all students, particularly students that might have some special needs. So Dave and Terry, take it away. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the first part of this, um, Dave Eveland, uh, and uh, if you happen to be looking in the, uh, the users list, I, I look like I'm coming in from Knoxville, Tennessee, even though my name appears elsewhere. That's because I'm also called in. Um, Terry Golightly is actually um, located in Grayson, Kentucky. Um, she's our other instructional designer, and uh, she'll be taking care of the second portion. So I'm going to introduce a little bit of how our course design process or development process works. And then Terry's going to pick up the second part and take us along a really neat journey that helps us understand how we sort of um, learn from some things and try and do accessibility in our courses uh, here at Johnson University. So to just give you a little bit of background about Johnson University, um, we originated in 1893. We have several campus locations. The uh, primary location is based in Tennessee. Um, we offer fully online PhD, master's, and bachelor's degrees along with other associates and certificates. We're fully accredited. Um, we have uh, CAPE and KREP accreditation, or at least recognized programs. CAPE is uh, uh, teacher education preparation, and KREP is uh, marriage and family counseling and professional counseling. Um, we have a rough uh, student to faculty ratio of 14 to 1. Um, that's across all of our students in all of our programs. Um, we moved from Blackboard to Sakai in 2009. We were hosted by Longsight. Um, in December of last year, uh, we upgraded from Sakai 10.2 to 11.2. Some of the priority tools that we use in Sakai include lessons, resources, um, stats. Uh, we use the new Gradebook NG um, uh, roster, um, uh, syllabus, and other tools. Um, we also use other tools that are not necessarily specific to Sakai um, or necessarily native, including uh, Verisite, the accessibility checker inside the rich text editor, or what's, what we understand typically is the CK editor. We also use Screencast-O-Matic. Um, we leverage Site Improve. Um, if you haven't looked at SiteImprove.com, um, it's a good place to go to in terms of trying to attack some of this accessibility thing. Um, we also leverage Quality Matters and the Online Learning Consortium's Quality Scorecard um, for improvement of your programs overall, regardless of whether they're online or not. Now we also use a product from Seed Company called Soleil that's meant to provide us um, engagement statistics and data on uh, how engaged our faculty, our online faculty, are being in their actual online courses while those courses are actually going on. I'm just going to stop for a second. If anybody has questions, please do put them in the uh, in the chat window. And if you need to stop me, please do. Um, uh, I have a tendency to ramble on, so stop me um, if I need to. There was a question. Yeah, you you forgot to mention Warpwire. Oh uh, yeah, Warp, sorry, Terry. I know you can't see Warpwire is actually on the uh, the slide there, and as is Verisite yeah. and, and Caption Maker. So good points, good points. Um, the Johnson University uh, DOE team um, is consistent of four people primarily. We went up from three to four um, with Terry Golightly coming on uh, on online with us uh, in the last year and a half. I think it is. Um, yeah. uh, is that right, Terry? It's July. It's just been this last half year. I haven't oh, been here. Last, this last, last, year, last half year. But yeah. Terry's been doing an amazing uh, set of work. Um, Terry and I work together closely um, uh, in, in terms of the course design and the quality parts, um, led by John Ketchen, and then we also have an administrative assistant 
who also helps with uh, uh, different things along with advising. So DOE at Johnson University basically works as a support structure for all of the different schools that we have. We have roughly eight different schools, and we work as a support structure for all of those schools. So um, different schools will decide to do different online programs or courses or certificates, and we work as a support structure for them. Um, so none of our individual schools have a specifically dedicated online infrastructure. We work as a support structure for all of them when they want to do those sorts of things. This uh, works within the context, uh, the development process then works within the context of both of our online and our hybrid courses. So uh, DOE, even though we're not the Department of Hybrid Education, we actually sort of absorb a little bit of that hybrid um, sort of sense. Um, and so anytime any of our schools wants to develop a program or an online course, um, then we come alongside them and assist with them with um, how to do that um, and what's best to do that, particularly because we, we tend to be very good experts, not just simply at uh, online uh, and not just at Sakai, but also in pedagogy and what's an andragogy, what's, what's appropriate for adult learners or, uh, you know, uh, right, out of or right out of high school uh, sorts of learners, that sort of thing too. So uh, let me go over real quick what our course development plan thing is. This is what we plan on doing. This is what we generally try and set forth for folks um, uh, as a development phase. When we go through and we're trying to develop our online courses, the first thing that we tend to do is a program dean or director will hire, contract, and, and select um, someone that's going to be the, uh, the SME or the content developer, the course developer. And then roughly from that point on, we normally say that it takes about 18 weeks. In fact, we prefer, um, we like to require that the development phase uh, for the entirety of the course from the starting point to the end uh, by the launch date um, should take uh, a, at least 18 weeks. We don't require this as a much uh, to say, you know, you have to have 18 weeks of development. Some people can move a little faster. Um, but most of the time, we really need at least 18 weeks to do a good quality development. Um, and I don't know what the development phase time frame is for everybody else. I'd really kind of like to know. Um, but some of that time frame also is dependent upon what your process is, um, how many people you have on your team, what kinds of quality checks you're doing, uh, the kinds of content you're actually having to develop, uh, that sort of thing. So I would be interested to hear from other folks. But our stage one, uh, we have three major stages in that development process. The, the first stage really is to complete what we all understand, what we understand and we use as uh, a development worksheet and alignment matrix. And essentially, I'll go over and show you some examples of what that is. But we really kind of think that takes about 15 weeks. The 15 weeks really is centered around the fact that all of our online courses, um, I would say 99% of them, are seven-week online courses. So we can offer seven-week online courses six times throughout the year with roughly a week break between those seven week sessions. And we roughly break out that development phase into around two weeks of development time for each week's worth of course content. Now that doesn't always work out that way. It's a rough estimate. It's like, you know, uh, saying, you know, it takes, you know, 60 minutes to get, you know, 60 miles from here. Um, that's not necessarily always true. Some people drive slower, some people will drive faster. Um, and then our planned development intended to have stage two have a single week of actually putting all of the course content into Sakai. Um, uh, um, Matthew's got a question really quick. He says in the chat, he says, Dave, when you say that you require a time frame, how does it work? So what tools do you use to require that? I'm going to cover a little bit of that in a, in a second. And I may not fully answer your question, Matt, but I do want to try and do that. Um, when we require a time frame, the required time frame is basically letting our program directors and deans know it takes 18 weeks to build out a course, a quality course. And if you decide that you want to have a course delivered in less than 18 weeks, then everybody has to hurry up and do quality work. Or when the course launches, it will not be quality and it will not pass good muster. Um, and the muster we use um, <laughs> is uh, some of the things that uh, Terry Golightly might touch on with regard to quality matters and accessibility functions. Um, uh, and accessibility within the course. We generally kind of reserve two weeks right before the course is supposed to launch or sometime two weeks ahead of uh, the course launching. Sometime uh, it could be four weeks, but two weeks at the end of the development phase to really make sure the instructor knows how to get into the course, everything works the way it's supposed to, um, if there are LTI components that those work the way they need to, um, those sorts of things. Um, so 
that's generally our planned development. Um, here's how we sort of flesh that out more. I'm not going to go over this slide a lot, but a lot of these phases have to do with us sort of working with the SME and going back and forth with the SME. Um, part of it is helping them to learn how to develop good course goals and structure um, and feeding back to them, uh, okay, this needs to change, this might need to, some adjustment, um, and, and we're not the content experts. They are. Uh, but we are content experts about course development uh, and a lot of times pedagogy because a lot of times our SMEs are content experts, not necessarily content experts in course build. Um, and so we, there's a lot of back and forth between us and them, or at least this is the planned way that we always intended to do this. The uh, third phase there, or stage two and stage three, is really just sort of a lot of back and forth, uh, developing the grade book, um, uh, helping um, them understand different uh, tools within Sakai. Um, we really like to try and focus on having our courses be driven by course objectives rather than uh, having course designers and SMEs come to us and say, well, tell me what Sakai can do and then I'll design my course. Um, we really wholeheartedly believe that if there are things that your students should know or be able to have to do by the time the course is done, then those objectives should really drive what happens within the context of an online course or even in a face-to-face -face course for that matter. Um, so that is all our plan uh, sort of stage. Um, uh, Jennifer uh, Lewinda says, uh, she says, only one week to put the course uh, in Sakai. Um, uh, yeah, that is the funny part. Um, so I'm going to kind of pivot off of that planned thing. This is sort of an overview of sort of what we expect that we would be able to do, kind of, you know, have this course development thing, and we go back and forth with the instructor or the SME for 14 weeks and then have this sort of build out in a, in a week. This is what we all, ex we sort of expected that we'd do, and we actually have a process in place where we explain this, we indoctrinate our SMEs with this, or at least we try to. Um, but the real way that it practically works, um, so this is sort of the undercovering of what, it re what really happens. What really happens is we go through and help our SME um, get through something that's called a course development guide, um, um, and I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. Um, but then we also go through the course development worksheet and alignment metrics. Um, Matt, you're asking about sort of, you know, what tool do we use? That CD-WAM, what we call CD-WAM, the course development worksheet and alignment matrix, is really one of those critical, critical tools. Um, in some cases, um, the SME is going to teach the course the first time through, and so we have an online instructor certification course that they also have to complete, um, which is a separate component. Um, but we have our program directors and deans require those uh, SMEs to finish, uh, or at least be finishing by the time their course launches. Um, and then we work with the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the, the SME to make sure their objectives are good, um, they do in fact drive instruction so that they are informed about the features and uses and tools in Sakai. Um, and then what normally happens is when they've gotten to a place where they've gotten a good start on that CD-WAM, then I take or Terry takes or John Ketchen, uh, we somehow take that first unit and we build that first unit out in Sakai. If they've got solid objectives and everything else is good, then we build out that first unit in Sakai with the idea, at least the original idea, that they would be able to take that first unit and continue to build out their remaining units in Sakai on their own. That really hasn't happened as well as we'd like it to. Um, in some cases, for lots of reasons, possibly for accessibility reasons, uh, for reasons that uh, uh, some SMEs are, are not nearly technically as uh, adept in Sakai, um, and so the course doesn't necessarily have a continuity or consistency, um, especially within programs. And so a lot of times the remaining units and content are built out by us, the DOE staff, rather than the SME. Um, this is all sort of bent around this idea of trying to make sure that our courses launch on time. Um, and then at some point toward the end, uh, the SME is paid for the course development. Um, uh, so, any questions so far before I uh, go to the next slide? I do have just one quick question, Dave. Um, can you give us an idea of approximately how many faculty members, how many courses we're talking about here? Do you have a general estimate of that? Um, Great question. So there's an amount of courses that we have at any one time. So, and then there's the amount of courses we might actually sort of develop within the context of a year. 18 weeks seems like a lot of weeks, and it is. Um, 
I, uh, right now, I'm actually working on two different courses. Um, we have um, Terry Golightly is actually um, really thick into accessibility and doing reviews of courses. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure, Terry, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure she's reviewed over 25 courses um, uh, since the time that she's actually started with us uh, for accessibility and for quality, um, which is slightly different from the development cycle. Um, but the thing that we have found ourselves in is because of the way that our school is structured, because of the way the Johnson University is structured, none of the schools is aware of any other school's um, motivations or desires to um, initiate and create new courses or programs. And so in many cases, um, we sort of have to um, go after each of those schools and say, if you're planning on developing online courses, we really need to know. Um, because you can't just, uh, we have had occasion in the past where uh, two different schools have said, hey, we need, um, uh, we need these uh, courses developed and um, the course needs to launch in five weeks. And we have flat out told them no. <laughs> um, and because, because of the constraint upon which we are, we, while we are support role, we don't necessarily have any sort of dictatorial standpoint. We, we can't say to those schools, you're not allowed to build the courses. But from the standpoint of being able to provide support and assistance to build out quality and accessible courses, when they ask us to help them build out a course in five weeks, when we are already uh, addressing other courses that have um, sort of really towed the line with trying to stay inside that 18-week parameter, um, we have some wherewithal to be able to tell them. And, and the provost backs us up and says, no, those courses aren't going to launch. Um, and you'll have to offer them later. Um, so um, as, as um, I think in any one year, we've probably developed 13 to 14 courses. Um, uh, I have to go back and look at some stats information. That when we have released, typically in the past when we have released the SMEs to do a lot of the course development for the successive units after Unit 1, the courses don't necessarily come out as nice or as accessible. And I think Terry could probably speak to that from some of her review experience. Yeah, Great I question. can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> I'm going give you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a point, uh, uh, an opportunity. So most of the time, then our new course build requests come in under the 18 will, uh, 18 week build requirement. Most of them do, um, uh, and part of that is because our deans and program directors, they just, you know, they're just like, oh, you know, just call the OE and they get on it. Well, there are some times where we do actually reject reject the requests, uh, sort of for assistance, um, and not because we're, you know, bigger or better than they are, just because it's not easy to create quality content and courses in that shorter amount of time. DOE then does most of the Sakai course build due to the limited time delivery. Um, and then some aspects of, course, of those courses still need follow-up and polish, and depending upon if they need captioning or accessible files. Um, Terry will talk a little bit about that. WCAG compliance. Um, and then we have also in, developed an internally, uh, in, we've internally developed a rubric for reviewing courses for quality and for accessibility. And Terry might speak a little bit more about that in her presentation. So this is sort of that CD-WAM that I was talking about, and I'll, I'll kind of give you guys a little bit of an overview. You can't see anything right there really, really good, I know. Um, but the course development guide is, or the, course de, the CD-WAM, the course development worksheet and alignment matrix, um, really provides a mechanism whereby faculty or those SMEs can go through and sort of lay out and frame out their entire course. And we do this intentionally before we ever allow them to get into Sakai, uh, because we don't want them to get into Sakai and start uh, sort of messing around with building out a course before they actually have a good foundational course. Um, that CD-WAM includes the course objectives, the program objectives, the course goals. Um, it also includes um, uh, the learning objectives that go along with each one of those units with hopefully very good verbs, um, good Bloom's taxonomy verbs. Um, uh, uh, and we, we go, with the, go through those with them to try and, um, I just got done helping develop um, or put together an accounting course and a lot of the course's verbs um, in every single part of the units were like understand, learn, um, um, and, and, and there's lots of deba debate about you know, sort of some of those verbs, but, but they need to be more precise. And, and working with the course developer, the SME, we were able to refine those verbs and, and better attack how that course is built, have a good foundation for it. Um, this is the actual alignment matrix portion of the CD-WAM toward the end. And the, the alignment matrix part, part isn't really meant to be complicated, but it sort of is. It's basically going through all the different learning activities that exist in the course as outlined earlier in the CD-WAM and 
calling out those different things that have to do with these items go with this particular set of objectives for the course. Uh, they fit into this area of Bloom's taxonomy gener gen generally. Um, they are this kind of participation. So is it student to student? Is it student to instructor? Um, is it student to content? Um, is, is there some sort of uh, faith integration uh, that's, that's a part of how we do things here? And then also, is there an assessment level that's actually at the course level or at the program level? And then how much time generally would that, 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 that item take? This is all meant to try and provide alignment then in, back into the course. We'll have instructors go through this last part of the alignment matrix and they'll discover, oh, I'm having students do this thing, but I don't have an objective for it. Okay, well that's fine. Do you need an objective? Um, or they may go through and they might, might discover that they have an objective in the course, but they don't have any sort of learning activity or assignment that actually addresses that at all. Um, and so that, ma that matrix really does help to make the course really, really um, a good quality course. Um, this is uh, just a screenshot of our course development guide. The course development guide is something we put all of our SMEs into um, and uh, helps them guide through a lot of this process. It's sort of that knowledge base and guidance uh, process. This is in Sakai. Um, and so we have a project site in Sakai that takes them through the introduction of how to build out a course uh, from a pedagogy standpoint, from a theoretical standpoint, covers Bloom's taxonomy, um, good verbs, um, online, develop, uh, online learners, that sort of thing. Uh, through those different stages, it mentions a little bit about ADA compliance and our FERPA policy. Um, and then this is a, a screenshot just of our online instructor certification course, which is also inside of Sakai. We only put instructors in here or SMEs in here, uh, content or course developers in here, if they're going to be teaching the course for the first time. You know, uh, a lot of times the SME for us is going to teach the course the first time through uh, because that helps to otherwise inform the course better um, uh, when we go to and try and do a polish on the course the second and third times uh, that the course is going to be offered. Um, so these are the kind of questions that I would have, and you can think about these questions uh, when I get ready to pull up Terry's um, uh, uh, presentation, because Terry's going to cover some of the things that have to do with accessibility and how we try and meld in accessibility um, into our courses, um, because I didn't really cover that, um, because it is a complex and messy process in some cases. I'm sure Terry will sh share you with that. But some questions that I sort of have, you know, is your development process different? Um, how large is your team? How does your team work? Um, do, you, do you use any sort of project management software to track your, um, your course build process and development? Um, we don't, um, uh, not because we couldn't, but um, I, I'm not sure how we would well, uh, do it well. Um, do you actually train your SMEs in how to use Sakai, or is that not really an important part uh, if you offload that to some other faculty or staff or, 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 or personnel? Um, and one other question, do you, do you build master course sites? Um, some institutions tend to use master course sites when they do the build-out process. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the next part of the presentation to Terry. And Terry, while I'm pulling that up, if you want to comment on anything I've said, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm Terry Golightly, and I have been with LAMP since its inception in 2005, and then I was with KCU until last July when I decided that my talents were better being used at Johnson University. And since July, um, one thing that has really come out in, in the process that we're going through is how necessary it is to make sure that our courses are fully accessible to all UNERS using universal design principles and such. And now we have an added imperative because the uh, government is going to require fully accessible websites by January 2018. Well, as it turns out, uh, a course, Sakai is like 78 or 80 percent accessible, which is really great. But that does not mean that our courses are accessible. And a lot of what we put into the courses will determine that accessibility. And the individual institutions then have a responsibility for addressing the accessibility. And then as it turns out, that brings up things like copyright compliance and all sorts of in the weeds kinds of things. So looking at my second uh, slide, um, WCAG is talking about four basic principles of accessibility. And this is kind of a checklist that we can use. And we're not talking about just what we put in lessons or tests and quizzes. We're talking about documents that we would present to students maybe through resources or 
whatever, that they need to meet criteria for readability and for screen reader access and being able to navigate through these documents. And so it, it's, it's really in the weeds kind of stuff where Dave was talking about it being messy. And it is messy. And sometimes it's detail work down to the nth degree. But the four principles of accessibility, the content, and this is content, any content that the student needs to interact with must be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Following the next slide, takes perceivable down a bit, okay? And you can read this. Eight to nine percent of people with Northern European descent have some degree of color blindness. And when we use content that um, is based in color, the red line shows such and such, and the blue line shows such and such, these people may not be able to perceive that information. And so we have to carefully choose how we are conveying content in a way that is not color dependent. For instance, 20%, up to 20% of the general population have some degree of dyslexia. And I showed this font to illustrate that some fonts are hard to read, but for some people, almost all fonts are hard to read. And so we have to be very careful about what fonts we pick out. It turns out on the next slide that font choices need to be sans serif font choices, and like the ones listed. We need to avoid italics as well as most serif, just because they're hard for up to 20% of people to really be able to get that content easily. Underlining can be perceived as hyperlinking, so we want to avoid underlining because a lot of times what we want to also avoid are URLs in our teaching content. So you put what Wakehead calls smart links. Uh, you might add a hidden link to the title of a resource rather than putting out the URL. So ABC123, retrieve from HTTP, blah, blah, blah. It's really confusing for a screen reader to read. And the blind person's listening to this URL go on and on. It's really easier to go ahead and put in that link on the title or some other part of that that they will perceive, oh, this is how I get there. I've even got to the there's a page that comes off the internet and there's a link on the bottom that takes you back to the original, it's going to be easier to just let that link read website link instead of the whole complicated URL. This has led me to a question I wonder if somebody in this meeting has addressed of how you do that kind of citation in a resources page because the um, APA and other standards will say that you put in the URL at the end of the resource but then again, it conflicts with accessibility. It seems like, in my experience, in my research generally, um, the favor is going towards that hidden link idea, that smart link, and making accessibility the priority. But somebody else may have a comment on their experience with that. The second thing that, that, a, doc, that a site needs to be is operable. All those pieces need to be operable. Everybody needs to be able to get in there and be able to get that information. You have to consider students who may be paralyzed, have limited hand movement, um, limited or no vision. I had one teacher at KCU whose issue was low vision, and he had trouble with the Sakai date picker because it was something like gray and light pink or something like that, and he couldn't see it. So all those things need to be considered. Um, how is your student, how would a student with whatever disability get access to your material? The um, NVDA has um, a screen reader that you can run through. Uh, Chromevox has one. Uh, see how those things work to access that material online and as documents. Uh, you need to be aware of the alt tags that have to go in 
when you're um, with with your navigational items. Those things need to be tagged. Now, Sakai will do that, like for subpage button or something like that. But if if you are adding navigational buttons, or if you have other things that are instructions that you, it, it's difficult for sighted people to understand how difficult it is for people who have low, low vision problems to get around. And so you need to consider that, okay, if I put on my blind glasses, am I going to be able to function in this area? In the next slide six, everything needs to be understandable. This is for the alt tags and long descriptions for meaningful graphics, tables, and charts come in. And um, if, if items are decorative only, you can, oh, I thought I had that somewhere here. The alt equals and then empty quotation marks need to go in the alt tag description so that the screen reader will just skip over it because it doesn't mean anything to the content. Um, extra descriptions of curly Q in the right corner, uh, it, it's just, it's just clutter, and they don't need that. Nobody needs that. And you need to consider under universal design principles whether or not you need to have that curly cue in the right corner at all. You have to use the heading styles. Simply bolding or, or doing some format change um, cosmetically to indicate a section is not, does not work for screen readers. They need to have those HTML tags, the H1, H2, H3. So you have to go in, and whether it's in Word or whatever, you have to go in and fix it so that those read those heading styles. You, you need to limit the visual clutter. Having a picture just to have a picture is meaningless clutter. If you're going to have that because you're thinking about people who care about the visual aesthetic, um, then you put the empty alt tag on there. So it's alt equals and then two quotation marks. Color and motion should not be tied to learning content. Again, that's reiterating the part about people who may have color perception problems and other people who may have problems with spinning things or flashing things, simulating um, some kinds of seizures or migraines, and a lot of people suffer migraines. I know I do. So you have to be careful that just because it's pretty or sparkly or ooh, shiny, you don't just decide to use it. It needs to be meaningful. Looking at the slide that says content must be robust, slide seven. So um, the content needs to be responsive to advancing technology. It needs to be strong enough to support the next version. Um, right now, I'm working with Microsoft Office 13 and uh, Adobe Acrobat Pro 11, I believe, and, um, and those give me the best tools to work with to get into this content so that it can be as accessible as possible. I'm looking now at the slide seven. And just to emphasize, if any of these are not true, users with disability will not be able to use the web. And I would add, or your content. So we need to go back through, and a lot of, most of what I spend my time doing is going back through these courses, opening up their content um, in PDF or in doc files, and, or PPT files and changing it so that it picks up all these tags and the reading order and all this stuff and gets in there and makes that content directly accessible to students. So students go into the course and they don't have to think, oh, can I find somebody to read this to me? Or they've got the tools and they've got the assistance that they need within the content. This is a good place to stop and ask if anybody has come up with questions. Carrie, um, I'll just add that there are some comments in the, uh, the chat area. Um, Louisa uh, uh, had the comment earlier that infographics can be a big problem on web pages when dealing with um, uh, alt text and providing accessibility. She also said that Wordle images, um, those word clouds that everybody has uh, loved uh, over the past several years, 
that are so easy to make and everything else. They also pose accessibility problems. Um, they're great for people who can see, um, but they are not great for people who can't see. And in fact, they are in many cases decorative. Um, uh, so uh, using that alt text with that quote quote um, in, inside the alt text is a, is a really good thing. Um, uh, somebody, uh, Tiffany actually, uh, Tiffany Stoll of UVA actually pointed out the recent uh, implementation of that Sakai uh, toolbar that floats on the left hand side. For people that are visual and can see, when that toolbar floats up and down on the left, that's really handy because it means you don't have to scroll all the way up to the top of a long page to use that navigation. But the problem is that really does interfere with that whole idea of content moving on a page or potentially flashing. Now, I don't think that tool area flashes, but it does move. Um, and so these are definitely uh, really, really good points that I think you're making. I don't think anybody's had particular questions yet. Is, does anybody have a question that doesn't want to post it in the chat area or wants to ask audibly? The rubric for online course review that Dave mentioned briefly is what I use uh, that we've developed, and that's uh, slide eight. And our rubric that we developed includes the items like uh, campus branding and campus style parameters, course and learning objectives. Um, Dave mentioned that we're concerned with developing those, uh, well, robust is a good word, uh, those verbs so that teachers are describing the actual learning and in measurable ways. Um, and then we have documents, a, a section that shows documents reviewed for accessibility through MS Office and including PDFs. Now, this is a good time to mention that I found even Adobe accessibility uh, information says that it is a better idea to do the tagging in, the, in a source word processor or presentation software. In other words, try not to have to use Adobe's accessibility checker. It is excessively complex, although you can drill down uh, and spend weeks and weeks and weeks at learning how to use it, but even Adobe suggests you don't do this. In uh, Adobe Pro 11, you can um, export or save as other, and it lets you save the material as a Word document or as a PowerPoint file, and then going into Word or PowerPoint, going through the accessibility checking process there, and saving it back to the PDF. Very handy and highly recommended you do it that way, because like I said, trying to do it through Adobe is very difficult. Um, some documents that come up that are not accessible and bring big question marks about copyright are scanned documents. We have some teachers or bees or whatever who will scan chapters or even whole books and put them, save that scan as a PDF file and then make that available to students. That is problematic in many, many ways. It's uh, probably a violation of copyright unless the teacher can document the, that he has um, been given permission by the publisher and or author for that material. And so that right there raises a red flag that we have to track down and make sure it's even legal to have that material in there. But then you're talking about having text presented as image files and you get into another whole thing there. So it may involve running down and saying, is there another way to get this material that does not involve scanning? Is this just something that's available generally, but the teacher pulled the book off his shelf and told his work study, go photocopy this? Um, you know, so that requires some follow-up if you, if you run into pieces that are scanned image. We are also looking can I, can that you I, are. Greg, can I make sure I know which slide you're on? Um, I think you may have skipped ahead a little bit faster than I was nine. actually able to track. Slide nine. Slide, okay, you are still on slide nine. Okay, good. Yeah, yes, yes. I'm just, I'm just dwelling a bit on documents reviewed for accessibility. Um, URLs need to be converted when possible into PDFs. So um, when. And are you HTML, talking about the whole, just the URL, like the, the, the website address? Are you talking about like um, if somebody has, 
a file that comes from what do you mean by that uh, that's what i'm that's what i'm explaining when you have a you are a, a referral to an article that is still on an html address you need to put that into a pdf and say that this is for a couple of reasons um, you've got a copy that is not dependent on a site not going down and um, hopefully you've got you know I, it, it's up there publicly so we assume that it's supposed to be public and available and all that kind of stuff but don't refer to the article in such and such a site download the article and put it in a PDF because then it's stable and you can also then work with it to make to tag it and make it accessible and change that PDF into your Word document and do your tagging and then change it back into a PDF. If it's a website, um, the URL documents are converted. If it's a website, don't use the URL in your course site. Use the hidden link. So, and then you're still going to be subject to broken links and that kind of thing, but you're minimizing it by taking the documents out and making them stable. Um, so that's what I mean. There are two different classifications. So what you mean is, you mean the idea that, you know, if I've got, if I've got a reference to some article, perhaps at CNN, I really want the students to read it, and I just link to it. Well, linking to it is not bad, but then the problem is I can't guaranteeably know that CNN has made sure that that article that appears on their website on that page is in fact accessible in and of itself. Right. So this provides me a means by which I could potentially then take that content, create a PDF, house it inside of maybe the Sakai's resources area, and before, of course, I do that, make that content accessible in, in, in a PDF format. Right. Yeah. And plus, the other thing with the URL is you don't know when CNN is going to take that article down, and it's no longer there. Yeah. So there is that. The other okay. So what we have on our rubric for online course review: the campus branding and styles, the course and learning objectives, the documents reviewed for accessibility, URLs converted, and um, Johnson University subscribes to the Quality Matters rubric. So. In our rubric is also embedded the basic uh, pr um, criteria for the quality matters and then the WCAG 2 specifications. And so that's the document that I use all the time going through these and reviewing them. I'm going on to slide 10. Okay. So the WCAG variables in the rubric, we are looking for, <coughs> and this is for accessibility purposes. This is specifically accessibility. The statement in the syllabus about accommodation, and that's required. And so we have a boilerplate section. Sometimes if it's not there, I just copy it off of my boilerplate and stick it in the syllabus. And I've got several sections that I'll do that with. It's pre-formatted and all that kind of stuff. We want alt text for every image. And if an image is not content related or if it is merely decorative, use alt equals quote quote. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, there needs to be descriptions of why that content is, um, is related. If the student is going to be held accountable for information that's in that graphic, it needs to be in the alt text. Uh, the descriptive link text with no URL showing is another thing we look for. Uh, the URLs are problematic for screen readers and for people who are trying to make sense of content. Proper use of headers. Um, proper use of tables that you don't use tables for formatting. Take them out. Uh, that just that just throws a screen reader all into all kinds of fits. Uh, you, we need to deal with appropriate color contrast, and there are um, there's a great instrument online, contrastchecker.com.org. Ah, it's it's in the uh, following slide that helps you to sample colors online and decide whether or not the contrast is appropriate. So you need to be using that. We are developing a process for acquiring transcripts and or closed captioning for all video and audio. YouTube does this 
mixed results, and it's a complicated process and will probably require third party as well as transcription by some of our administrative assistants and work studies. But this is, this is a necessary part of making content accessible. And, and again, in the universal design, Dave and I were talking the other day when I took a course that had all this stuff done and you had a, an audio thing and a video thing and a transcript thing and such, I usually chose the transcript just because I can read faster than that guy was talking. So it, it just presents uh, multiple better choices for students. Um, your content needs to have keyboard functionality so that um, when you have hot keys for certain tasks, it's responsive to that. It's assistive technologies, accessible. Of course, we all think about the screen readers, JAWS, and whatnot, and that there's enough time to complete activities. And then the final element is we're looking to make sure that there's no flashing, spinning, all that kind of thing going on. Now, when I converted a document, going on to slide the next slide, slide 11, <coughs> um, what I do is I'll open the document, and then this is showing I save as other. You can save as other Microsoft Word, Word document. You also have spreadsheet and PowerPoint presentation options available. And I run the accessibility checker. Of course, you go up to your ribbon and you add tools to your ribbon. So you've got the accessibility checker. And then you address each individual item that comes up. If you click on the item, then you get it, it um, brings out the bars around that item you're talking about. My goal is to get through all these things that come up on the accessibility checker and for it to say that no accessibility issues are found. That doesn't always happen. This thing with infrequent headings sometimes doesn't go away. But you can see that there's been some work done on this. Now you've got it, and, and the next slide shows save it to you as a PDF and upload it to your site to replace the document. And then it's linked internally and all that kind of stuff if you just save it as a new version in your resources. Now here's a chart that I came up on. And here, there are some issues with this chart. Um, the one on the left is the one that the teacher put up. And this is illustrating items in, in the International Phonetic Alphabet. And it doesn't mean a whole lot to me as a person who's not a subject matter expert or even somebody who's taking the course. But there are several problems with this chart. And the first problem is color. The green may not be perceivable by, by many people for different reasons. Low vision people would have a hard time seeing the green. And, um, and the blue and the red, you know, this is a problem with color. So I changed it to black and white. But that doesn't solve all the problems. How does somebody who doesn't know this content refer to the special symbol? How do they perceive, how do they interpret the movement in the chart of the lines? And what, do those, uh, what does that content mean? And so here we need to have um, a developer or an instructor actually do the alt text because it doesn't mean anything otherwise. And it's helpful to a visual person, again, but not to somebody who may be learning this otherwise. So that's just an example of the kinds of things that you, you have to make decisions on and say, OK, when does this need to be referred back? Um, how does, you know, when does it need to have input from the subject matter expert? Now, the next to the last slide, Dave, I'm getting there. Um, going forward, what we want to do with the Department of Online Education, we are developing the protocols for closed captioning and transcripting for all video and audio. This is a big item in a lot of ways, but this is, this is our, one of our top priorities going forward. We also need to promote professional development of faculty so they know how to put these alt tags and informational things within the documents themselves, because they're going to be the best source of information for what needs to go into these. It's also a top priority to improve copyright compliance. Um, John is working really hard on developing a tight copyright policy. And he's um, 
and we're talking about the scanned articles or chapters that are coming in and what are the copyright constraints if there are any on altering copyrighted items for um, screen accessibility. That's my dog at the thunder that's going on, I'm sorry. But, any, but we need to consider, that, but then I found in my research yesterday that accessibility does receive priority. So there is implicit permission to make copyrighted articles uh, um, accessible, uh, to alter them for accessibility. The last slide is a bunch of resources that you, can, that you might want to uh, kind of get an eye on. WebAIM is a great one for making accessible web sources. Um, there's great information at Microsoft. W3 is the WCAG stuff. The contrast checker, that's, that's something that you can just put up and it comes up immediately when you hit Control C on your, on your website and you can compare your um, colors and make sure that the, that the color contrasts are appropriate. And then there's a blog thing about the 508, Section 508 accessibility requirement that's coming up for next January. And that's where I am. Dave and Terry, thank you guys so much uh, for putting this presentation together for us. A lot of really, really great information here. A lot of really, really great resources that you provided. Unfortunately, we're almost out of time for our session today. It's three minutes till 11. So if anyone has any questions and you guys would like to follow up with Dave and Terry directly, I wonder if one or both of you would be willing to put your contact info in the chat. Dave has read my mind, which is awesome. Yeah. I hope he puts mine in too because I'm more than willing to answer questions or have a conversation about it. And he did put yours in. Thank you, Terry. So Dave and Terry's email addresses are there in the chat. So feel free uh, to copy and paste those and reach out to them directly if you have specific questions or specific feedback uh, that you can share about things that are going on in your institutions. And I encourage people that are continuing to explore accessibility issues at their own institutions to share that on the larger Sakai list as well so that we can continue to generate some conversation about those because that would be really, really great. Uh, just a quick note about what's coming up for this group over the next few weeks. Um, on March the 15th, so two weeks from today, we have a Sakai Lessons Round Robin. And Dave Evelyn has committed to make a return performance and will be there as part of that round robin. Uh, Louisa Lee will also be a part of that. Um, we are looking for maybe a couple other volunteers to be a part of that as well if you're available. If you're using lessons at your institution right now, we'd love to hear a little bit more about how you're doing that. So if you're interested in participating in that, uh, please feel free to contact one of the moderators. Um, either myself uh, or Tricia Gordon or Neil Caden, um, or uh, send out a message to the Aperio TL email address and let us know that you're interested in participating. Uh, we will probably also be pestering people via that email list. Uh, Tricia has very kindly put her email address in the chat, uh, so feel free to send her an email directly. And Louisa has done the same, so thank you all very much for doing that. Uh, so please feel free to reach out to any of us if you're interested in being a part of that from the presentation perspective. We would love to have you. The more, the merrier. And our following meeting uh, scheduled for April the 5th is open. Uh, we don't have anything scheduled for that date at the moment. So if anybody is interested in participating or has a particular topic uh, that they are interested in and would like to suggest, either for themselves or for another presenter, uh, please let us know because April the 5th is open right now. Um, on April 19th, um, Nadine Blanchette from HEC Montreal will be here to talk about Tengen Course Outliner, which is something that they have developed there. So any other final comments or questions very quickly before we sign off here? I don't want to cut anybody off. All right. Well, seeing none, um, thank you all so much for a really, really great presentation and a really, really great conversation. 
We look forward to seeing you all right back here in two weeks to talk a little bit more about the lessons tool and how that's being used across Sakai land. Thanks very much. Have a wonderful day, and we'll see you all back here in two weeks. Thanks again.